So a lot of people think about learning and it's actually hard to pin down a definition of what we all mean. We spend a lot of time in the book trying to uh, define it, the five of us, the authors together. And uh, what we landed on is um, considering learning as a process that leads to change, which occurs as the result of experience and that it increases the potential for improved performance and future learning. So there are four elements in that definition. The first one is that learning is a process. Um, learning is something that happens inside the brain as we process the information. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot see the process. We can't open the head and look inside. Uh, and so we can only judge learning from the product, uh, which is the, the exams that the students write and so on. Uh, but that creates a confusion in the students sometimes that that is the goal, when in reality the goal is uh, the wheels turning in the brain. Uh, the second thing is that it should lead to change. True learning uh, changes your perspective, your outlook, the way you look at the world. And um, it happens because we're elaborating our experiences. Uh, and that's happening all the time, sometimes even when we're not conscious of it. We're always processing what is happening to us, whether that is in an academic environment or anywhere, really, at home with our family, at the park, at the stadium, we're always reflecting on what's happened and processing, explaining why that happened, finding reasons, and, and, and that's all part of learning. And finally, it's, um, we can judge it from the fruits in the sense that true learning will open doors for us will uh, allow us to get to the next level. So it has the potential for improved performance or uh, the potential to keep us on an iterative cycle where we are better able to go deeper and deeper into our learning. Learning that closes, up, closes us off is not true learning. Learning that opens us up to the world is uh, the kind of learning that we're after. We basically did a literature review uh, of uh, the last 50 plus years of research into learning. And um, from a multitude of perspectives, because the learning sciences are actually an interdisciplinary field, even, even the name, it's learning sciences, plural. And uh, so we looked at uh, research in cognitive psychology, we looked at research from uh, motivation and developmental studies. We looked at research from the School of Education, um, research in anthropology, research in, uh, in the field of diversity and inclusion, um, and even research from the, uh, the business school in terms of um, group learning and organizational learning. Um, and we tried to uh, find the things that had the most su empirical support behind them, the most research making, uh, validating the findings. And it turns out that a lot of these things come up repeatedly in, in all these different fields. And so that was even all the more reason to consider them strong. And uh, we converged on the seven things that had the most support that we could find. Um, and we organized them in a, in a somewhat linear way, although not, not always, uh, for, for ease of exposition. Uh, but in reality, they're all interactive. So when there is something happening in the classroom, there is an issue that students are not learning, it's rarely the, the, the fault of one principal only. Usually there's a convergence of factors. Uh, but just for exposition, uh, these are the seven principles in the order we arrange them in the book, which is um, almost a chronological order in a sense. And so we start with prior knowledge. Prior knowledge matters. Uh, Prior knowledge, um, students possess knowledge before they even get to uh, our courses, before they even arrive. Um, and that knowledge can either be good for learning or can actually hinder learning and performance. And so all these principles work in this way. They say something is important for learning. If used in the right way, it will facilitate learning. If not properly incorporated in the classroom, it will actually hinder learning. So the first one is prior knowledge. Um, the second one builds on the first one and it says it's not just how much students know that matters, 
uh, but it's also the quality of that knowledge. And the quality is measured in the brain uh, by the connections that we made between, between different pieces of knowledge. Um, the third one also starts before students get to us in the classroom, and it's the motivation. Student, uh, students come to us with their own levels of motivation, um, but at the same time, research shows that there are things that we can do as educators to affect uh, and hopefully increase that, uh, that motivation. Um, principles four and five switch gears a little bit because they talk about um, how we learn skills, how do we develop competencies how, or, and, and mastery of a subject. Um, and they talk about the kind of practice that is important, that allows us to uh, get better and better and develop our expertise and the kind of feedback that we need to, um, to become better. Principle number six is, uh, it's almost two principles in one. It talks about uh, the level of development of the students, the maturity of the students, um, which can be conceptualized in many different ways, intellectual, social, emotional, um, ethical, moral development. Um, and the level of development and maturity of the student determines how deep each student can go into the subject. Uh, at the same time, when we have a course, we have all different students with a profile of um, different levels of development, and that creates the combination of all those um, profiles creates um, almost like a personality of the course uh, that is more than the sum of the parts. Uh, researchers call it the climate of the course that also interacts with the um, with what the professor does to facilitate uh, learning and to um, make students feel welcome uh, and valued in the classroom. And that thing is um, beyond being the sum of the individual uh, profiles that the students bring to the classroom, becomes an element in its own right and that also can facilitate learning or um, hinder it. And finally, the last principle um, starts in the, in, in college, but continues after students have left us. Uh, and it's the idea that we can teach our students everything they need to know. And so we hope uh, that by the time they're done with us, they have acquired along the way, um, not just the content, but some skills that will allow them to continue learning on their own, to become lifelong learners and take responsibility for their learning. And what that principle talks about is that that will not happen naturally, but that there are some conditions that need to happen for the students to develop that uh, self-direction in their learning. <laughs> I think it's very important. Um, in the current system, it is changing a little bit, but the dominant assumption about the way the higher education system has been set up and worldwide is that the one thing that professors need to teach well is knowledge of the content. Um, prof uh, teachers at uh, lower levels in high school, in junior high, in grade school, need to have a lot of training on how to teach, but somehow that was never part of the formation of our university professors. And while obviously the content is hugely important, an expertise in the content uh, as part of a professor qualifications, but we all had um, the experience of those professors who were so bright and so smart and they just could not explain it to the students. And so we don't want to be like them. And I argue that um, the biggest investment that a professor can make beyond content knowledge is to really understand the learning process. Because then they can teach in a way that the students will understand the material, will relate to it, will find it interesting, will um, apply, will remember it, will be able to think critically about it. All those uh, skills won't happen on their own, but they will only happen as a reflection of the fact that the professor truly understands what it means for the students to learn something, to know something. Um, 
I think there are at least a couple different levels of challenges. The first one is um, just the change process itself. When we try to implement something, um, we become learners ourselves. We're novices at learning about teaching. And so just like our students, we won't get it right the first time. We try something new. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it works in certain ways, but it falls short of some other objectives that we had. And so then we need to evaluate what happened, why did it happen, how could I make it go better next time. That's all part of the process. We don't expect that professors will start changing their courses and everything will be magically perfect. Um, but maybe professors don't know that sometimes. And it's easy to be discouraged and say, oh, I tried something, it didn't work, so I'm just going to go back to my traditional method of standing at the board and lecturing. Uh, and so my advice is it takes time. That's part of the whole process. Don't worry. Um, it's also important because it takes time to have a supportive environment. If I try something and it doesn't work and my department, my uh, chairperson uh, penalizes me for even trying, then the lesson is don't try. The lesson is stick to the way you've always done it. Um, and so uh, it's important for the university administration to also have an outlook that says failure is an expected part of trying new things. A percentage of them will fail. And so we need to be understanding and we cannot um, uh, penalize professors just for trying. Uh, and the same is true for students. Um, although we don't control student behaviors, but in the United States where um, a lot of, um, a big part of our uh, evaluation process for professors is student feedback from the end of the course, um, some students will actually also not be receptive to the changes and then give professors um, poor evaluations. And so my advice is to, um, to always implement change uh, incrementally. Don't change the whole course. Change, uh, start changing one thing, one unit, one module, one week, one activity. See how that works. Uh, get buy-in from the students, explain why you're doing things, and then gradually build in more changes. And pretty soon, your course will be uh, completely transformed. Yes, I would say that um, one recommendation that I have for teachers is, um, is to find community. Um, teaching, interestingly enough, teaching can be a lonely process for professors. Um, we are very used to the idea in academia that research uh, needs to be a public process. Research is not, is not good until it is um, sent to a journal to be peer reviewed by peers who understand what we're talking about and then it's accepted and then it's disseminated for larger consumption by the larger uh, scientific and academic uh, and intellectual community. Uh, we present at conferences, uh, we write, um, that's all part of doing research. Teaching is so different instead. We get into our classroom, we shut the door, and it's just us with our students. And I've felt it for myself the first times when I have invited somebody from the teaching center to uh, observe my courses and give me feedback. I knew I was doing something good, and at the same time I was so anxious. Oh my gosh, they're coming, they're coming to observe me. What if I make a mistake? Um, they're going to see me, uh, and, and they know what they're, what, uh, they, they are experts, and so they will find all the flaws in my teaching. And so I actually almost didn't, almost canceled it the first time. Uh, it was very anxiety producing. Um, but instead, uh, it was very supportive. When they came, it was very encouraging. And, uh, and then I saw the, the side of, uh, of uh, the good side of teaching that happens when we invite other people in and all of a sudden we are uh, bouncing ideas off of each other, we're, we're brainstorming, I'm saying, what do you think if I try this, do you think that would work? And so my advice is to find that community. Maybe it's professionals from the teaching center. 
um, they know the teaching and learning process. They don't necessarily know your field. They don't know the culture of the department. So actually, you might also want to find some people in your department who also uh, teach similar courses to yours and maybe are going through the same struggles and um, start having those conversations. The more we can um, open up the doors to the classroom, the more fulfilling that, uh, that job will be. You're welcome. Thank you so much uh, to Sadhu for inviting me to beautiful Barranquilla and beautiful Colombia. It's been uh, my pleasure to interact with you and to learn from each other. And I hope our paths cross again soon.